Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on labor market economics and conservation. And in this lecture, we'll have a look at earnings and discrimination. Now, before we begin, let us recap what we had observed in the previous lecture. In the last lecture, we had a look at the neoclassical theory of distribution. And in that, we saw these salient points. The amount paid to each factor of production is derived from the supply and demand for that factor, which means that we were saying that in the case of the labor market, the demand for labor and the supply for labor will determine how many people get employed in the market and what is the rate at which they will be paid or the wage rate. Second, the demand for a factor depends on its marginal productivity, which meant that if there is a person who is uh, is giving out a larger amount of output so his or her marginal productivity is higher and in that case the wages that will be offered will also be higher third in equilibrium each factor of production earns the value of its marginal contribution to production which means that if somebody is contributing greatly to the production of something that is valued high in that case the person will be earning more and a good example is people who work in making of a software that is valued high and they are uh, they are putting in the major share of making that software so in that case such people will be earning a lot more than those people who are working to make something that is not valued that high or those people who are working to make something that is valued highly but are putting in a very small or a minuscule contribution to the actual making of that product. And a good example is a person who is working for the security of the premises where the software is being made. So this person is not putting a very major share of contribution in the making of the software. And in that case, the wages that are offered to such a person will be much lesser than the wages that are offered to a software engineer who is actually making the software that is valued high. And the corollary said that if somebody is uh, putting in a contribution to a production of something that has a lower value, or when the contribution to the production is less, then in that case, the person will be earning less, which ultimately gives rise to poverty. So in in the previous lecture, we were analyzing what causes poverty because we had seen that poverty is intimately related to conservation. Now, this is because if the society is poor, then in a number of cases, we have observed that the population size will increase. People will have less per capita resources, which would mean that their marginal productivity will be less. And to feed the large population or to get resources for the large population, when the marginal productivity is less, the only option would be to expand into the forest areas. And in that case, the forest will be indiscriminately cut, converted into agricultural fields. But still, because the forests are generally in those areas that do not have a very good fertility, so the marginal productivity will still remain less. The people will still remain poor. But in this case, the forest will also be gone which is why it is important to understand the, why poverty uh, arises in a society. But then apart from the, the neoclassical theory of distribution, there are also a number of other factors that determine how much a person is paid. And in this lecture, we will look at some of those factors. So what are the factors that modulate the uh, predictions of the neoclassical theory? Now, one such modulating factor is the compensating differential. Compensating differential is defined as a difference in wages 
that arises to offset the non-monetary characteristics of different jobs. And good examples are night shifts or dangerous jobs. So what we are seeing here is that several jobs have certain non-monetary characteristics, which is say, uh, a way of saying that there are certain jobs that do not have a very big difference in the amount of remuneration that they will provide, but they have certain characteristics that differentiate them against each other. So a good example is a person who is working as a security guard. Now, whether this person provides security in the daytime or whether he provides the security in the night time, the kind of service that he is providing is the same, which is security. The amount of input that he would have to make in uh, keeping himself uh, attentive to the details is roughly the same. But still, it is easy for people to work in the daytime than in the nighttime. So this is a non-monetary characteristic of this particular job, whether a person is uh, going to work in the daytime or in the nighttime. Now, because working in the nighttime is more difficult, so people are paid more. Now, in this case, they are being compensated for a difference in a non-monetary characteristic. So the difference is the um, uh, is whether they are working in the daytime or in the night time. And this non-monetary characteristic differential is getting compensated. So this is a difference in wages that is arising to offset. That is, we are trying to nullify or we are trying to compensate for the non-monetary characteristics of different jobs. So examples are night shifts that pay more or dangerous jobs that pay more. Example, coal mining. So a person who is working in a sector to carry load from one place to another place, that is a person who is working as a porter, will be earning less money if he is doing the work of a porter in a market or say in the railway station, but he will get much more amount or much more amount of compensation or wages if he is working say in a coal mine. Why? Because coal mines are generally dirty places to work, they are generally dangerous places to work. Because at any point of time an accident can happen with a greater probability than an accident occurring say in a market area. So because people have to be lured to work even in these difficult surroundings or in these dirty surroundings, so they will have to be paid more. And this is known as the compensating differential. So this is a compensation for the differential characteristics of certain jobs, especially depending on whether they are more difficult or whether they involve working in a, da in a dangerous situation or in dirty situations. So this is known as a compensating differential and this modulates the predictions of the neoclassical theory. Another difference that modulates is the human capital. Now, human capital is the accumulation of investment in people, such as education and on the job training. It is an accumulation of investment in people, that is, how much amount of investment has been accumulated in a person by means of things such as education or on the job training. And a good example is that income increases with education and income increases with training and experience. So what we are observing here is that if we talk about people having the same experience, but different education levels doing the same job. Now, if you'll remember when we were talking about the neoclassical theory of distribution, we were saying that the amount paid uh, that at equilibrium each factor of production earns the value of its marginal contribution to the production process now in this case what we are observing is that people are doing the same job so the the neoclassical theory of distribution would say that these people should be paid the same amount but in actuality what we are observing is that people are paid different amounts so a person who is a graduate of the high school is paid less 
a person with a certificate or diploma is paid more than the high school graduate a person with a bachelor's degree is paid even more a person with a master's degree is paid even more and a person with a phd is paid even more now even though these people are doing the same job and they have the same experience the only difference is the difference in the education levels so in this case what we are observing is that we that we are paying these people more on account of the accumulation of investment in the people by means of education or training so this is a modulating factor so because of this factor the new classical theory of distribution does not exactly apply so this modulates the results of the new classical theory to some extent now here again a person who is working in a sector that is making things that are valued very high in the market and is putting in a major contribution is will be earning more than a person who is putting in a smaller contribution or a person who is working in a sector whose output is not valued that high so the new classical theory still remains so if we talk about two people who say are uh, software engineers so they will still be paid more than say uh, two people who are working as security guards but among these two software engineers the one who has got more education will be paid more so this is a payment that is being made on account of the greater education that this person has this is a payment on account of the human capital that has been accumulated in this person by means of higher education so this is human capital that modulates the uh, results of the new classical theory now the question is why should somebody do that why should a firm pay more to a person who has a higher amount of human capital accumulated in that person and there are several reasons one education and training increase the marginal products of labor and this is true to quite an extent education and training increase the marginal products of labor so what we are saying is that if there are two people who are say working as software engineers and one person is just a novice he has just come out of a college and there is another person who has say accumulated a lot of training by working in some other company or he has acquired education by working in uh, uh, an academic institution so he has gained a masters degree or a phd degree now what happens is that when the person has been working in a particular sector or has gained a higher education in that particular sector then they are exposed to a lot many challenges a lot many problems than a person who is a novice who may not have been exposed to those challenges now because of these exposures and because of having an ability to solve the problems in those situations in a number of cases people learn how to tackle certain situations so for instance if there are two software engineers and there is a particular bug that has come up or crept into the software then a person who is more experienced either by uh, account of a higher training or by account of uh, say a higher education he will be in a much better position to find out where the bug lies because in his lifetime he has experienced several such bugs in several sorts of codes whereas a novice may not have been exposed to so many problems and so he will have to start from the scratch so in this case the marginal productivity of the person with higher education or with higher training will generally be higher so this is the first reason that education and training increase the marginal products of the labor and so the human capital leads to a higher payment as in the case of the neo classical theory of distribution another reason is that higher education is the compensating differential for the cost of education both in terms of opportunity cost and time involved so what we are saying here is that the higher income of the people who are educated more is the society's way of compensating them 
for the, the troubles that they have taken. Troubles in terms of the opportunity cost. That is, if the if the person with the higher degree, if he or she had not uh, gone for the higher education, he or she would have been working somewhere. And by working somewhere, they would have been earning some amount of compensation, some amount of payment. Now, to get the higher education, they have to forego this payment. So, there is an opportunity cost that is involved. A person who is going for a higher degree is not going for the work in the labor market and the society needs to compensate that person for the loss of that opportunity. So the society compensates for the opportunity cost and the society also compensates for the time that is involved. Because a person who goes for a higher education, for a higher degree, has to spend a, a lot number of years in an educational institution working on, say, very theoretical subjects. Now, this person, by working on these theoretical subjects, will also gain an insight into problem solving. So, that will increase the marginal productivity later on. But currently, when the person is there in an educational institution, he or she might feel that there is a huge amount of pressure and there is so much of time that needs to be invested into higher education. So, this is uh, all this needs to be compensated by the society later on when the person joins the job market and the higher income to people with higher education is a way of society compensating for this loss of opportunity and putting up of so much amount of time, which are all the cost of education. So in this case, what we are saying is that because education is difficult, so the society needs to compensate for this differential. That is similar to the case of a person who was working in a night shift or who was working in a dangerous profession, they need to be paid more because there is a level of difficulty involved, there is a level of danger involved. Similarly, a person who has put up so much of cost into education in terms of opportunity cost and time will also have to be compensated for because higher education typically is difficult. And the third reason is that education and training are signals for higher ability. So, what is a signal? Signaling is defined as an action taken by an informed party to reveal private information to an uninformed party. Signaling is an action taken by an informed party. Which means that when we talk about a person who is getting into an, uh, an employer relationship with an employee, so suppose I am the owner of a firm and I need to check who is the best person uh, for the job. Now, I do not know how good person A is, how good person B is. Now, they are having this private information that uh, probably person A knows that he is an extremely lazy person. But in the interview, person A will not tell me that, sir, I am a lazy person. Probably person 2 is completely disregardful of uh, punctuality. So it is possible that person 2, when I lead, uh, when I if I hire him, then probably person 2 will never come to the office on time because he is completely non-punctual. But then person 2 will not come to the interview and say, sir, I am a person who, who pays no heed to punctuality. Both these people, when they come for the interview to get the job, they will be projecting themselves as the best person for the job. So both of them would say, sir, I am a very hard working person and I am a very punctual person. Now the employer, when he needs to know which person to hire, how is he to extract this private information? Because nobody is going to tell the employer that these are my limitations. We have a situation where, the, where there are certain people who have this private information about their abilities and about their disabilities and there is another person who is the employer who needs to extract this private information out of these people. So herein comes signaling. It is an action taken by an informed party to reveal the private information to an uninformed party. So what will both of these people do? These people, suppose person 2 says that, sir, I am having a 
so and so degree from such and such institution. Then this is a signal that person two is providing. So in that case, the employer finds it much easier to judge whether he should hire person one or person two, because the employer would think that okay, I have these two people and both of them are saying that they are the best person for the job. But then the first person does not have a higher degree. The second person has a higher degree from a very prestigious institution. Now it means that. Person two was able to secure an admission to that prestigious institution, and at the same time, person two was able to pass with flying colors. I can see his grade sheet, so I can see if this person is able to put up hard work or not. So this is a signal. Now it is very similar to say a peacock when he when it dances. Now when a peacock dances, it spreads its feathers for the peahen to see. If this peacock is fine or not, so when it, peacock and peahen when they are mating, when it's the mating season, the peacocks will show off their wings, and if there is a peacock who uh, which say is uh, a diseased peacock, so in that case, the disease will show itself in the wing patterns, because a, a peacock that is a diseased peacock that is not getting enough resources, then in that case probably. The feathers will not shine that much, or probably it will have less number of feathers than a peacock that that is in the prime of its health. Now, by showing themselves off, the peacocks are giving a signal to the peahen that this is my ability, this is my level of health status. And similarly, in the case of education, people can use their education as a signal to tell the prospective employer. That these are my abilities. If I have a degree from such and such institution, it means that I am able to put up hard work. It means that I am a a punctual person. So whatever the other person says, that is immaterial. You can just have a look at my grade sheet, and you can make your own choice. So that is signaling. So education has a very important role in signaling. Similarly, training. Because if a person has Been hired by, say, a very prestigious firm before. So then the employer will get this idea that if this person could work in this firm, then probably this person is a good person. He is, he will be an asset to our organization as well because he has already worked in such a prestigious position. So this again is a signal. So signaling is an action that is taken by an informed party to reveal private information to an uninformed party. Now, there are certain characteristics of good signals. These signals must be costly so that everyone doesn't get to use them. Which means that if you use a signal, suppose there are two candidates who have come for a job interview, and the first candidate says that sir, I am very fond of Jagjit Singh songs. The second candidate says sir, I am very much fond of Kishor Kumar songs. Now, in this case, whether a person listens to Jagjit Singh or whether he listens to Kishore Kumar, that has got little to do with the kind of work that is involved in the firm. And at the same time, it is very easy to get hold of Jagjit Singh songs or Kishore Kumar songs because these days everything is available on the internet, or people can listen to these songs or watch these songs on radio or television. So people have an easy access to these. Whereas for a signal to work properly, so in this case, the song that a person hears will not play the role of a signal, because the employer would say that how does it matter? Because to get this signal to listen to say Kishore Kumar songs or Jagjit Singh songs, you do not have to incur a very huge amount of cost. So there is. No great cost involved. Whereas in the case of education, it is extremely costly, both in terms of money for fees, both in terms of opportunity cost that somebody has to give up, and also in terms of the time that one has to put in. So signaling will only work when it is costly, so that everyone doesn't get to use them. And education is costly. And secondly. Signaling will only work when it is something that should be more costly 
for the lesser quality product than for the higher quality product which means that if there are two people one listens to rajesh singh the other uh, listens to kishore kumar then there is no difference between these two people in terms of their abilities whereas in the case of education if somebody says that i was able to secure this grade at this institution so in that case a person can very easily make out that doing this thing was difficult for a person with lesser ability but doing this is easier for a person with higher ability so passing is easier for a person who is hard working or who is intelligent or who is diligent but passing is more difficult for a person who is say lazy or unintelligent so in this case there is a differential costing involved which means that signaling is cheaper for a person with a higher quality or with a uh, with a higher ability but signaling is costlier for somebody with a lesser ability so education becomes a very good signal because it is easy for somebody who is having the desired qualities but it is costly or even costlier for a person with lesser abilities so a person who is having a lesser ability in terms of uh, say uh, doing problem solving or in terms of putting up punctuality or working hard now this person will find it extremely difficult to pass a course whereas a person who is hard working will easily pass the course so in this case there is a difference that is uh that exists between a person with a higher quality or ability and a person with a lower quality or ability so this is another characteristic of a good signal it should be more costly for less quality person or product than for a higher quality product or person whereas if we wanted to use listening to a song by kishore kumar or jagjit singh as a signal then there is no difference between the cost for a higher quality product or a lower quality product of us so a person with a higher ability will also find listening to these songs equally easy or difficult than a person with a lower quality so it does not work as a signal so signaling should be something that is costly and this cost should be different for people with different abilities and because education is both costly and it has a differential costing for people with higher and lower abilities so it acts as a very good signal now if a person has a higher degree from a more prestigious institution then it acts as a very good signal and the employer will can make this decision that yes this person is intelligent and this person is hard working and this person is punctual and you can add a number of other adjectives here so signaling modulates the results of the new classical theory another thing that modulates the results is the ability effort chance and appearance ability so higher ability people get higher wages and this ability may be a result of heredity upbringing exposure and so on so what we are saying here is that suppose you have two people who are working in a job say they are working as porters now one person has a higher ability which means that he can work for longer hours and he can pick up uh, heavier weights now this person with the higher ability will at the end of the day earn more than a person with a lower ability now this is because the person with the higher ability is able to put up a greater marginal product so in this case what we are saying is that people with higher ability they get higher wages and this ability it is not necessary that this ability stems just from the person but it may be a result of heredity upbringing exposure and so on so a person who is born to intelligent parents may be intelligent because he got intelligence in heredity so even though this person is not putting up that much of an effort but still he this person is able to pass easily so in that case he will be able to get an education with lower effort 
But then once he gets this education, it will act as a signal in the market. Or this difference in ability may be because of a difference in upbringing. So there could be a case in which um, the parents have inculcated the tendency in their children to work very hard. On the other case, you can have parents who have not inculcated this ability. Now, in this case, the upbringing would lead to a difference in the ability because at the end of the day, the child one, when he grows up, he will be working very hard as compared to child two because it it, it is there in his upbringing. So, from the early childhood on, he knows that he needs to work hard. And so, it's now a part of his character. It's a part of his nature. So, upbringing can also make changes in ability. Exposure can bring changes in ability. So, a person who has worked in different sectors or a person who has worked in different countries and is exposed to different sorts of problems will have a higher ability for problem solving than a person who is not exposed to these things. So exposure may change ability and in the case of ability, a person with higher ability will typically get a higher wage even though both of these people are working in the same sector. Effort. A person who is putting up more effort is paid more than a person who is not putting up enough effort. So basically if there are two candidates, both have equal abilities, both have equal education. But what happens is that person one uh, works for 12 hours in a day, but person two works for only two hours in a day. The rest of the time he does not work. Now in that case, because person one is putting up more effort, so in that case he will typically earn much more in the market. So he will be getting a higher wage than person two. So the the, uh, the result of the neoclassical theory of distribution is modulated by the effort a person puts in. Higher effort means more wages. Chance. Now, this is a very important factor. Students who are graduating during a recession time may get paid less. Now, these students may be having the same ability. They may be putting up the same amount of effort than their previous generation of students. That is uh, their seniors but just because the market is in a recession period in that case uh, it may be more difficult to get a job or it is also possible that the job that these people get will be paying them less now this is not because of any difference between the students of this class and the students of the previous class it's just a luck factor just a chance factor People who graduate during times when there is a recession, they typically get lower wages. So a chance factor is also involved. Appearance is also involved. Because good looks may be needed for certain jobs with public exposure. So if you talk about, say, a job such as that of a news anchor, so a person who looks uh, better, who has a better appearance, may be paid more. Actors. Now, in the case of actors, if they look beautiful, if they look smart, they, they might get a higher payment. So, appearance may play a role, especially in those jobs that involve public appearances, say, in, uh, with the case of TV or cinema. Good looks are also a signal of upbringing and, and ability. So, they, they might be needed or they might act as a signal. Now, it is a signal of upbringing and ability. Example, does a person know how to tie a tie or not? So in this case, it is acting as a signal because if a person knows how to wear a tie properly, if a person knows how to wear a suit properly, then probably they have been brought up in an environment where these uh, things were already taught to them. So with these, people can make out certain deductions about the qualities that people might be having. Because you have an indication of the kind of upbringing this person has been through. So good looks might be also a signal. And in certain cases, the beauty premium may be just a form of discrimination. So ability, effort, chance and appearance regulate the wages. Then we have the superstar phenomenon that regulates wages. 
so people like lata mangeshkar or sachin tendulkar or amitabh bachchan earned way above their peers so they are the superstars of the society and lata mangeshkar earned much more than other singers of the same time who were probably putting up the same amount of effort but those singers were getting paid less but lata mangeshkar was getting paid more sachin tendulkar got much more are uh, income from playing cricket than another person who was probably putting up the same amount of effort now why do we have these people who get way above the average wage rate that is prevailing in the society so not all the singers get paid equal to that of lata mangeshkar not all cricketers get paid equal to that of sachin tendulkar not all actors get paid equal to that of amitabh bachchan now this is the superstar phenomenon and it happens when every customer in the market wants to wants the goods supplied by the best producer so basically if you have a chance to uh, watch a movie by amitabh bachchan or by, or to watch a movie by an actor who is completely unknown so people would generally think that because amitabh bachchan is so good at, at acting so let us watch that film so people want to have the product of the best producer of that particular world so lata mangeshkar is probably the best singer so she is the best producer of songs especially hindi songs sachin tendulkar is the best producer of the entertainment or the thrill that you get by watching cricket and most of the people want to have the best and the good that is produced is so produced that it is possible to provide it to every customer at a low cost it is possible to provide it to every customer at a low cost so what we are saying here is that suppose the good is something like uh, the work of a doctor now in this case a doctor when he is treating one patient will not be treating another patient at the same time and so depending on the demand and supply in the market the amount that the doctor will charge to the patients will change so if there are very less number of doctors and there is a very great amount of demand then probably the doctor will start charging more so there will be a natural equilibrium in the market and we cannot provide the services of a doctor to everybody at a very low cost but what happens in the case of professions such as cricket or profession such as acting so once a movie has been made it can be shown to n number of people for a very low cost so these days when we watch a movie on a streaming medium it hardly costs anything to watch the movie so everybody can now afford to have the services of the person who is the best producer of the good in the case of a doctor not everybody gets a chance to afford the services of the best doctor whereas in this case the good is being produced and distributed in such a manner that everybody can afford to have the good of the best producer so everybody can watch sachin tendulkar play on the tv screen everybody can listen to lata mangeshkar songs at a very low cost everybody can watch amitabh bachchan act in a movie at a very low cost and it is only in these professions that we start to observe the superstar phenomenon so in the case of superstar phenomenon you have certain superstars who get paid way above their colleagues because there are two things one they are the best producer of the good that they are producing and every customer in the market wants to have the goods supplied by the best producer and second the good is being produced in such a manner and is distributed in such a manner that it is possible to provide it to every customer at a low cost so in that case everybody will just flock to the best producers of the good and so the best producers will be earning way above the second best which is not the case in, say in the case of doctors so the best doctor may not be earning way above the second best or the third best but in the cases of superstar phenomenon 
the people who are the best they earn way above the second best or the third best so that is the superstar phenomenon and this is something that is not explained by the neoclassical theory of distribution so this is another factor that modulates the wages that people get in the market if they are working in a sector that permits them to provide the goods at very low cost and when they are the best in the field and they are working in a uh, um, in a sector where everybody wants to have the goods or services by the best in that case they might be earning way above the crown so that is the superstar phenomenon another modulating factor is the case of above equilibrium wages say because of the minimum wage laws so in this case the government is influencing the wages that people will be getting so the neo classical theory was saying that people are getting wages that is equal to the value of their marginal product of labor but the government may tinker with it and the government may say that no this is the minimum that you will have to pay these people so we have observed that in the case of a non binding price floor so suppose the government has put up this price floor that this is the minimum wages so in this case by law the government is saying that this is the minimum wage that you need to pay and suppose the market is paying above this minimum wage so this is the natural equilibrium in the market then we do not have an impact of the non binding price flow but in case the minimum wage which is shown by this red line is more than the natural market equilibrium that is shown by this point so in that case there will be a difference between the quantity that is demanded at this price so quantity demanded is given by this point where the demand curve is intersecting with the price curve or the price floor curve and the quantity that is supplied is given by this point where the supply curve is intersecting with the price curve and in that case we will have a quantity demanded that is less and a quantity supplied that is more and we will start to observe a surplus in the market so the actions of the government may tinker or modulate the results of the neo classical theory of distribution and in these cases we can have a surplus a situation in which the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded impacts selling is possible only for a few sellers in this case workers who can appeal to racial family or other ties so what we are saying here is that in the case of minimum wages because there is a less demand there is a huge amount of supply so not everybody gets uh, paid not everybody gets work and those people who can appeal to say familial ties or their cultural ties or their linguistic ties they might get an employment and other people will not get an employment now the neo classical theory of distribution was saying that every person is getting paid according to the value of their marginal product of labor but in the case of such government intervention said it is possible that two people who can put up the same value of marginal product of labor one of them gets employed the other one just does not get employed so this is a modulation it may result to losses to sellers due to unsold inventory so in in this case the sellers are the workers because they are selling their labor so there will be a losses uh, there will be losses for the workers because of their unsold inventory in terms of unemployment so the workers in this case have labor to offer to the market for a price but because the price has been increased to a level above the market equilibrium so nobody is hiring them so this is a loss to the workers and this may also have a long term impact in terms of closing of industry or job losses because the price is a bit too high for people to pay so in that case it will be difficult for people to run their industries or it may be difficult for people or at least some people to run their industries and because of that they might close the industries which would result in an even greater unemployment so this is another modulating factor 
to the neoclassical theory of distribution. Another example of, uh, or another case of above equilibrium way is union. So unions can do collective bargaining and use strikes to demand above equilibrium wages. So in this case, the workers will not get paid according to the value of their marginal product of labor, what the neoclassical theory of distribution was saying. But in this case, what the unions do is that they go for a collective bargaining and they say that if you do not pay us this much amount, we'll strike. A union is a worker association that bargains with the employers over wages and working conditions. And strikes are the organized withdrawal of labor from the firm by a union. So in this case, the union says that if the firm does not pay us or pay the workers at this rate, we will not permit anybody to work. Now, this is very similar to the case of uh, the minimum wages that are uh, put in place by the government. Now, even in this case, the wages that are demanded are above the natural equilibrium of the market. And we might also observe that in a number of cases because of these strikes or because the of the inability of the firm owners to pay this uh, high away, they may just close the industry. So there will be huge amount of unemployment. But this is also another case that is modulating the results of the neoclassical theory. And third is the use of efficiency wages by firms to raise productivity, retain good workers, reduce turnover or save the expenses of hiring and training. And in this case, the efficiency wage is described as the above equilibrium wages paid by firms to increase the worker productivity. Now, in this case, there is no role of government. The government is not saying that the firms should pay above the market rate. The workers themselves are not saying that uh, the firm should pay us above the market rate. But the firm, in its own best interest, pays the workers above the market rate. Now, why should a firm do that? Well, this is because even though when one person is fired and another one is fired, we can achieve the same quality at the same rate, but the, the process of firing and hiring, they are also expensive processes. Because the firm will have to put up an interview, it will have to call for applications, it will have to search all these applications, it will have to interview, there will be a decision making that will have to be made and all of these require costs. So the company might say that, okay, the people who are working for us and we know that they are working well, let us pay them a bonus so that they do not also have an incentive to go to another company. So they will not leave us and the amount that we would have had to spend to organize an interview we will pay that amount to, the, to these people so our headache of hiring a, a new person is reduced and these people will go on working for us and we know that these are the good people so we want them to work for us so the company might pay people or pay its workers above the uh, market equilibrium in the, to increase the efficiency of people or to retain the employees or to compensate for the alternative which would be to hire another set of workers. So these are known as efficiency wages, above equilibrium wages that are paid by firms to increase worker productivity or to retain good workers, to reduce turnover or to save the expenses of hiring or training. Now in this case because uh, the firms are taking this decision out of their own free will, they will hardly be uh, negative consequences. We also saw that another way in which uh, the results of the neoclassical theory get modulated is discrimination. Now discrimination is defined as the offering of different opportunities to similar individuals who differ only by race, ethnic group, sex, age or other personal characteristics. So, when we talk about discrimination, we are saying that there are two workers who are practically the same, they have the same education, they have the same ability, they will put up the same effort, but still we employ one and we do not employ other because the one that we are hiring probably speaks the same tongue or belongs to the same community or the same religion. So in this case, we will say that we are discriminating one against the other. 
So it is the offering of different opportunities to similar individuals who differ only by race, ethnic group, sex, age or other personal characteristics. A good example is the gender pay gap. The average difference between the remuneration for men and women who are working. So even though men and women might be having the same qualifications, the same education, they might be putting up the same amount of effort, but in certain societies by tradition, the women get paid less. So this is the gender pay gap. In our country, the gender pay gap in the year 2007 was 44.8%. And for the year 2013 was 24.81%. So we are observing that as our society is modernizing, the gender pay gap is reducing, but we still have a long way to go. So this is an example of discrimination. Now, a free market in, so in certain cases is able to solve the problem of discrimination by itself. Now, how is a free market able to solve this problem? In a competitive market, a firm that cares only about profits will make products at a lower cost than firms that do discrimination. Because the firms that are doing discrimination might at times be hiding workers with lesser abilities or who are putting up lesser effort. Because they have this um, criterion of the person belonging to the same community as one of the criteria of hiring the people. Whereas another firm who is, that is not discriminating and is looking only for profits, this firm will be hiring the best workers. And in that case, the firm that is not doing the discrimination will end up producing the goods at a lower cost. Which would mean that in, uh, in the medium or the long term, this firm that is not doing discrimination, that will uh, gain a larger share in the market because they are producing the goods at the low, at the least cost, at the lowest cost. And we have seen before that in the case of a competitive market, the firms that produce good quality products at the least possible price, they are the firms that, uh, that get the orders. So over time, the firms that care only about profits will outcompete the firms that practice discrimination. And thus, a competitive market with free entry and exit can automatically remedy the employer discrimination. Which tells that the free market, if there is a free entry and a free exit, which means that any firm that is able to produce goods at a, a cheaper price and at a better quality is able to enter into the market. So in that case, the firms that are not doing any discrimination because they are having the best workers, they will make cheaper products with good quality. They will outcompete those that are doing discrimination. And in a short while, we will see that the market is only occupied by those uh, firms that are not doing any discrimination. So the market has a way of tackling discrimination by the employees, which is also why we say that markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. But the sad part is that this may not always happen because in certain cases we observe discrimination by customers or discrimination by the government. Now, if this is the situation, then the market will not be able to solve this problem by itself. So if customers are willing to pay to maintain the discrimination, then free market will not by itself remedy discrimination. By this, what we are saying is that if customers say that we do not care about the quality, we do not care about the price, we only care about whether this product was made using workers of our own community. So even though we get products at a higher price with a lower quality, that is okay with us as long as people from our community uh, are getting jobs. Now, in such a scenario, the free market will not be able to solve the discrimination because people are paying for the discrimination. In the theoretical context, we had said that people are rational decision makers. So everybody is trying to enhance their welfare by getting the, uh, the best quality material at the cheapest cost. 
but if people do not do this this rational decision making in that case the free market will not be able to solve the problem of discrimination in certain other cases the discrimination can also be government mandated example apartheid in south africa so in certain cases the government may itself say that only people belonging to such and such community are going to get employed now when uh, discrimination is government mandated then again the free market will not be able to solve the problem and in such cases legal remedies may be needed to counter such discrimination and in our country we have a number of such legal provisions especially in our constitution so article 14 in our constitution says that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of laws within the territory of india so our constitution is saying that the every person is equal in the eyes of the law and will get an equal protection of laws article 15 says the state will not discriminate the state shall not discriminate against citizen on grounds only of religion race caste sex place of birth or any of them then the constitution says that nothing in this article shall prevent the state from making any special provision for women and children or for the advancement of any socially and educationally backward classes of citizens or for the scheduled caste or the scheduled tribes the constitution is also saying that there shall be an equality of opportunity for all the citizens in matters related to employment or appointment to any office the constitution is also saying that no citizen shall get discriminated against because of these factors then we have the constitution saying provision of reservation then we have options like untouchability being abolished we have things like equal pay for equal work for both men and women so what we are observing here is that in our country legally because of the constitution we have had several provisions that are aiming to remove or reduce discrimination so discrimination by the state is completely removed and in certain cases the societies that were discriminated against historically they have been provided a larger opportunity by means of reservations and because of these provisions we also had a number of laws that were made the equal remuneration act the maternity benefit act the factories act and we also have affirmative action in the form of preservation special education and awareness opportunities so what the government is doing by all this is that in our country we are trying to remove discrimination and so we can also touch upon uh, the principle of of economics that governments can sometimes improve the market outcomes because we saw that if the society is doing the discrimination and is paying for the discrimination then the free market will not be able to remove discrimination in this case the government can act the government can say that you cannot discriminate and also the people that you have discriminated against we are going to provide them with greater opportunities so that they get a level playing field from now on and so the government can sometimes improve the market outcomes and so to sum up in when we talk about wage uh, determination the new classical theory of distribution says that the amount paid to each factor of production is derived from the demand and supply for that factor the demand for a factor depends on its marginal productivity and in equilibrium each factor of production earns the value of its marginal contribution to production so this is what the, the new classical theory of distribution says but we have observed in this lecture that the results of the neoclassical theory 
can get modulated by the compensating differential say in terms of uh, more uh, wages for difficult jobs or it can get modulated by the quantum of human capital how much is the amount of education and the training with a person it get modulated by the ability of person whether hereditary or otherwise by the effort a person puts in the chance factors whether the market is booming or in recession the appearance of the person it can be modulated by superstar phenomenon in those uh, sectors where uh, everybody wants the best product and these products are can be made available cheaply to everybody they can get modulated by the minimum wage laws by the unions by the use of efficiency wages by firms or because of discrimination so there are a number of factors that can modulate the results of the new classical theory of distribution so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai